Welcome to a very special Transmissions Podcast interview event. I'm Charles, a.k.a. Big C. I'm here with Yusuf, better known as Yoshi. <laughs> Jeremy, a.k.a. Yakko. Hello. And Daryl, the Cybertronian Beast. How you doing? Let's talk Transformers. <laughs> All right. And we have a very special guest. There are few creators who have contributed so much to the Transformers franchise, from iconic characters to core elements of the Transformers mythos to epic stories. Simon Furman has had a hand in it all. Not only was he one of the seminal writers on both the original Marvel UK and US comic series, he's been a key contributor to Transformers comics in every iteration, from Marvel to Dreamwave to IDW. He's written Transformers stories for nearly every entertainment medium, from comics to television to video games. It is our profound pleasure to welcome Mr. Simon Furman to Transmissions. Hey, great to see everyone and lovely to be. Thanks for inviting me on. It's great to have you. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure's all mine. <laughs> all right. Well, let's let's get right in and and start off at the very beginning so how how did you get into writing for the uk transformers comics back in the 80s well you know by luck uh, i was really just starting out at the time i'd only written a few stories for a british horror comic called scream you know just junior kind of creepy stories for kids and you know i was just looking for any really script writing opportunities at the time and I was lucky enough to know Ian Rimmer, who worked at Marvel UK, who in turn introduced me to Sheila Craner, who was the editor of Transformers UK at the time, which literally was just off the launch pad, you know, maybe a few issues in. And Sheila was looking for original content for the comic, Transformers stories created by UK teams, uh, largely because it had been such a success and even though the US was going to an ongoing series the UK comic was already almost caught up with that in terms of what they'd reprinted and because it was fortnightly at the time they knew they would need uh, stories to fill the gaps while there was no US material to reprint and so before I joined uh, Sheila had approached Steve Parkhouse and John Ridgway, who put together Man of Iron, which turned out to be the first of the UK stories. And at the same time, J Sheila handed me a, a dossier of character profiles and uh, toy pack shots and, and basically said, come up with some story ideas. And the first one I pitched was The Enemy Within. and. Thankfully, that was picked up, and the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> awesome. So uh, much later, I mean, after about 50 or so issues, uh, Bob Budiansky actually passed the U.S. series over to you as well. So how did that come about? Well, by then, I'd met Bob. I'd been to uh, Marvel U.S. I'd, uh, you know, we'd, we'd obviously, we corresponded over plots and, and you know, just keeping up to date with what they were doing. But, you know, when I finally got to meet Bob in, I suppose it must have been about 87 or 88, uh, we got on really well. And just, you know, just on a personal level, Transformers notwithstanding, we we, we really were, you know, we, we enjoyed our, each other's company. So we established a rapport and a friendship right from the off, really. And then a year or two later, when Bob, came over to the UK, of course, you know, at any visiting Marvel US person, we rolled out the welcome wagon, really, and took them out for lunch, took, you know, showed them around, as, you know, as much as we were welcomed over at Marvel US offices. Mm -hmm. And when Bob came over, he and I just went out for lunch, and over lunch in Covent Garden in London, he just said, you know, I'm kind of burned out on the book. He'd been doing it for you know, best part of 50 issues, and he'd done so much of the setup. And he was just kind of, you know, I'm ready to pass the book over. He felt the book was more or less on its last legs. 
you know, the sales had dipped. By that point, it was a miracle that it was still going as strong as it was. So he just said, you know, would you like to take over? He, strangely, he wasn't the editor on the book. He was only the writer. But he he had the authority, I guess, just to offer it to me and then tell editor Don Daly that that was the arrangement. So it was all amazingly casual over a beer and a whatever food we ate. But, you know, of course, I was, I was thrilled. You know, even if it just went four issues, it was my, my foot in the door at Marvel US as far as I was concerned. You know, you know my account opener there. So I obviously hoped it would go longer than that, but was quite prepared that it may only be four issues or six issues. And and yet that conversation we had and Bob's slight sort of pessimism about the title was somewhat inspirational as well because there, there became a sort of vested interest in saying, you know what, I think we can keep it going longer. I think we can give it a, a shot in the arm, a creative makeover a little bit. You know, I just feel that, you know, Bob had – his own sort of way of telling stories, and we had our own way over in the UK, and we just felt that if we injected some of that grandiose space opera, gods and monsters feel that we put into the UK comic, into the US, we might, you know, sustain interest at the very least in the the readership we had. Mm Mm-hmm. Did did you wind up getting some of those same restrictions that that Bob had in terms of having to introduce uh, new characters and things? Uh, not so much. We did. There was a certain amount of product that was still current and relevant at the time, and you know we were happy to include MicroMaster. My very first storyline is a glut of MicroMasters, really, and and that was okay as some of them were already in the story. But but why now Hasbro were, I think, less focused on Transformers. You know, it was still a, a toy line that they produced, but they were winding down with that and probably looking in other directions. So we never had quite that same. And, and the toy lines after that barely came at all. I don't know whether there were many post-MicroMasters that had to be in the book. And so we were free largely just to gather some of the characters that had never been in the comic and get those into the storyline. So, yeah, we largely, and Hasbro were always really good with us. You know, every plot had to be run by them, and they were just generally very supportive, and we didn't have anything vetoed. And, you know, we even got to do a little April Fool's gag with them where we sent them a plot that was so ridiculous. And, you know, they, they you know, got the joke and just generally our, our relationship worked really well and and of course we we managed 25 issues to till it finally was over so it felt a very satisfying amount we got out of that tail end of transformers mm-hmm. so what is it that keeps you coming back to transformers so as you mentioned bob budiansky did get a little burnt out and uh, since the 80s, he's he's largely left the franchise behind. He, he comes back and does conventions and talks about uh, his, you know, the glory days and everything. But you've continually brought new ideas and stories to the franchise and you keep doing it. So uh, and we're grateful for that. So what what is it that keeps you coming back? I suppose initially it kept coming back to me and, you know, and that was a good thing. But, you know, I fully expected and when I wrote that sort of rather glib, it never ends at the end of on issue 80's letters page. I actually fully expected that was the end. You know, toys at the time, I don't think really came back for encores. So, you know, G2 was a surprise to me as much as anybody else. But, you know, was I happy to jump back in? Certainly. You know, it, it, it was... You know, I like I enjoyed myself with G2 immensely. And again, I don't think Hasbro with G2 were so invested that they were going to be all over their storylines. They let us do 
much what we wanted to do with G2. And, 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 so, and so it's been. It, it keeps coming back. Every time I think I'm finished with Transformers, you know, they pull me back in as, as, the, <laughs> as the quote goes. But, you know, but it's, it's sort of it's shaped and defined my whole career. And, and certainly, latterly, I'm, you know, incredibly grateful <clears throat> for how much it's, it's guided and opened other doors for me with, and, and just generally kept me in work for a career now of 30 something years. So it, it's, it's always been very, very good to me, Transformers. And, and nowadays, whenever I get a chance to jump back in with something like Transformers 84 or Transformers Earth Wars, the game I'm working on, you know, I'm more than delighted to do so. So um, we've uh, we've seen the UK comics get collected in the IDW collections recently. Uh, I think there's there's been five or six volumes published so far, but uh, we haven't seen everything get collected. And we know uh, the U- in the UK you're getting the G1 definitive collection that has a lot of the um, the UK comics there. But sadly, that that doesn't reach us uh, over here in North America. Uh, is do you think there's there's any hope of getting a completed collection of the UK comics? I would I would absolutely love for IDW to do and you know for apart from anything I love James Roberts annotations and editorial sort of packaging that goes with those collections. You know it's really thorough as you'd expect from James, and you know I love all that stuff. I think he's done a great job with those. So I'd love to see it happen and. You know, of course, we have those black and white stories from the tail end of the UK run in colour now. John Paul Bove coloured all them up for the definitive G1 collection, which is behind my head at the moment. <laughs> all our little intersecting spines, and you can see oh, yeah. those. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All hundred volumes. For- <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, it, it's, it's just a dream for me to, to get that on my shelf, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's a it's a big weighty thing for the shelf. It's it's it ended up a hundred volumes, so uh, wow. it, it's a pretty massive collection. But yeah, you know, John John Paul did uh, all sort of brand new, but sympathetic to the time, like he did with eighty four. He re he coloured all those little five pages. So it you know the good thing is if IDW do get around to a volume six and maybe a volume seven all those stories will be in glorious full color now. So uh, I wanted to, to, t- I mean, we can't, we can't go into your entire Transformers career cause we'd, we'd be here forever. But uh, I did want to, to ask you just what you think of how people have taken a lot of the concepts that you introduced and created and, and expanded them in other Transformers stories. I mean, uh, I, I think you're responsible for Primus, the Wreckers, the Fallen, the Thirteen, all these things that have become kind of bedrock in Transformers story these days. And a lot, and you, know, you mentioned James Roberts; he's taken a lot of your ideas and and taken them a little bit further out in different directions. Nick Roche is another, uh, I think, uh, UK fan turned uh, professional who, who took a lot of your ideas and expanded on them. What what do you think of that, and and what do you think of uh, how how you've influenced other other writers and creators? Well, I mean, I think it's great. I you know I love it. You know, I love to see particularly things like the wreckers used and and repurposed and 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 restored. I guess you know we we never had a clue we were building a mythos back then. You know, we were just introducing story elements that seemed to fit the story at the time and the fact that they've now become part of something bigger a whole you know mythos that underpins almost every iteration of transformers is is very satisfying and very uh, flattering i guess that these things you know in terms of hasbro even are, are sort of now deemed part of the fabric of Transformers. But, you know, by the same token, it's also great just to see that other creators can come in and just go off on wonderful tangents and add huge new dimensions to these concepts. And, and you know, rather than just slavishly say, here's the records, here's Primus, here's this, 
you know, they do their version of them, their take on them. Of, you know, everything with the IDW universe was meant to be a, a new, fresh coat of paint on these characters. We didn't want to just do the same thing. You know, our mission statement almost from the very beginning was if it's been done one way, don't do it that way again. If a character is this, don't lose that, don't throw it out. But can, is there a way we can spin that in a different direction, maybe? You know, give another slant on things. So, you know, everything that creators like Nick and James and uh, John Barber and everybody who's come since is is really just following that underpinning idea of taking what was there before, like the wreckers, and saying, okay, here they are. We're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but this is literally our take on the wreckers. This is a new take on the wreckers. It's not exactly the ones you know. And I think that's, you know, healthy for the brand. I think it's really good that things don't just are static and well you can't tamper with that you know these things are there to be tampered with and given that fresh coat of paint and given a a new lease of life really and i feel that's largely what the idw verse has done with things it's it's taken what's there you know all the stuff that i created bob created you know the toy makes created many talented people all contributed and just, you know, saying, okay, well, that's it. We don't want to get rid of that, but we're going to do it our way, give it a fresh spin. And and that's just, I think, why Transformers keeps going. It, it's not just the same thing rehashed. It's it's a different take, a different slant. Mm-hmm. Is it, do you have a, a favorite bit of Transformers lore uh, that, that you've uh, contributed that, that, you, that you're, uh, you're gratified to see pop up now and again? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I love the fact that, you know, we brought Unicron into the comic continuity and then gave him the yin to his yang in the shape of Primus. And and I love, you know, I grew up reading, apart from the British comics that were available, you know, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby's Fantastic Four or Thor or, you know, and I loved just how kind of bonkers the ideas were you know celestials galactus uh, you know the inhumans you know every issue of the fantastic four was some mind-blowing out there concept cosmic stuff and and really all i tried to do with transformers was say look this is these these are alien beings there's got to be a whole intergalactic storyline here you know there was a little tendency for them to be a bit earthbound you know i get that why that was but i wanted to reintroduce that sense of they they had a standing in the universe that there were literally primal forces at work behind this and give it that grandeur that lee and kirby and many others used to inject into those marvel comics i loved so you know i love that we got the primus unicron thing in there the wreckers will always have a, a, you know, a big place in my heart just because what's not to love about them. And, and, you know, I, yeah, I, you know, there's, there's so much. And I'm, I'm always pleased when, like I say, I see something that I've contributed to the, the brand endure and evolve. And, and I just feel great. You know, if other people like it enough to want to use it, that's as flattering as it gets. So, um, uh, so you've, you've done uh, a lot of work, uh, you know, in all the iterations of Transformers comics, Marvel Dreamwave to IDW. And you mentioned with IDW, you got to create kind of a completely new, fresh take on the Transformers universe. So how did you compare that experience with, the, with what you'd done with Marvel and Dreamwave where you were, you, you didn't come in at the Genesis, but you had, you had uh, been contributing, but the, but with IDW, you got to basically birth a whole new Transformers canon. Yeah, it was a new thing for me with IDW. I'd always come into something up and running before that. Even the UK stories had had one out there before I jumped in. But And, you know, no problem with that. But it was deeply refreshing to be able to say, look, 
let's this this starts here. You know, there may be stuff we haven't seen yet, but we're building this in blocks from the ground up. And and when I when I put in my initial pitch, you know, Chris Ryle and I chewed it over for a long time to make sure that it was it was the same but different enough. You know, like that old movie quote, give me the same but different. And I, th- I think we wanted to make it recognisable to fans, but make it completely a, a, look, a jumping in point. You don't need to know it. You know, hopefully you can pick up infiltration and not know anything about Transformers and just read it. And it builds as you go along and you understand more about it. And, and that was it. It was that idea that we didn't want to bring a lot of baggage from previous iterations along with us it had to be a it felt like it had to be a fresh start and it was very liberating for me to start to build our own transformers universe so yeah it's it's almost unique in as much as that's the first time i've ever got in right at the very beginning mm-hmm. yeah it, it must have been fun to kind of pick and choose what characters you added in because uh, you know a lot of a lot of uh, before that, a lot of Transformer stories had tended to start off. You always start off with the season one and the season two characters, and that's it. But really, I got the sense that you said, "Okay, I've got this entire universe of Transformers characters I can pick from." Okay, yes, the the first core group will introduce the season one characters, of course, because everyone's familiar with them. But then let's throw in lots of different characters, and and I really thought that made the IDW universe uh, very uh, kind of inclusive and expansive. Yeah, I mean, one of the touchstones we took was the Marvel Ultimate line, you know, which took all those characters kind of back to basics, but remade them a little bit. And and that was the, even the pacing of those stories was something we wanted to, 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 to kind of include, to make it part of this, that it wasn't just this, you know, issue one of Marvel's Transformers comic, starts off with double page spreads more or less of all the characters just introducing themselves and we wanted to drip feed characters into the narrative to hold optimus prime back till the very end of infiltration to maybe have megatron only peripherally involved at first and just you know that perspective thing of having the thing expand in front of the eyes of the humans involved in terms of the first Transformers we meet are Ratchet and Runabout and Runamuck, maybe Thundercracker, I think, or Skywalk. But they're, they're not sort of key, key players. We don't we actually see a transformation until issue two or the end of issue one. You know, it, it just, we wanted to, avoid doing the way the way it's done before and bring in that slow slow burn you know maybe a little too slow because i think at first the feedback idw were getting of course we we were in the internet age so it was happening as we were putting infiltration out that idea that i think readers were maybe getting antsy for some some full-on robot action which is when we devised and commissioned Stormbringer. So almost we were responding immediately to the kind of feedback we were getting on infiltration. And it's like, well, okay, let's do the Cybertron storyline and that you can have robots aplenty in that. And meanwhile, we can continue this slower curve in infiltration escalation. And then the spotlights came into the mix. So it was very much an evolving continuity you know we were responsive i think to the 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 way it was being perceived and so suddenly you had stormbringer suddenly you had the spotlights and everything then felt like we could take our time on the core series i think that did help the universe feel a lot like lived in as well Uh, i enjoyed that yeah and you know and we wanted you know some people don't like kind of humans in Transformers or they'd rather just have the robots. But we really wanted, I don't think you get the awe aspect of the robots unless you're looking up at it literally like Verity does when she encounters Megatron and you're getting that sense of gasp and look up 
So we, we very much wanted it to be a human-centric first arc and for you to care a bit about those characters. And, and you know, talking about subsequent writers picking up, I was always very pleased when Nick or James would bring back Verity into the storyline because, you know, I, I had a definite soft spot for that character as, as we went along with the original series. So uh, let's let's talk a little bit more about Transformers 84. So you mentioned uh, Optimus Prime. I didn't want to maybe I'll use that to segue into one of the questions I had about uh, Optimus Prime. So, uh, yeah, you mentioned the the little bit of shading you gave to him and his decision to to sacrifice the arc. Uh, the expanded backstory that comes up in Transformers 84 makes his sacrifice uh, at least, uh, you know, of course, this is given hindsight of four million years later, but it does make it seem a little bit more foolhardy than noble that, you know, he he's he basically sacrifices himself and all his closest friends to take to to at a chance to get rid of Megatron, not realizing that there are other Decepticons that are maybe just as bad or even worse that and he, he puts Cybertron in a worse position. Do you see Optimus Prime's kind of urge for self-sacrifice as maybe a character flaw, like a core character flaw that he has to deal with? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I think, you know, I think he makes the decision he makes in issue zero for all the right reasons he thinks. You know, mm -hmm. it, I think it, he really is thinking we're in an impossible situation. There's only one thing to do here. And he gets it wrong. And, you know, that's what I love is that a lot of their everything that rolls out from that is effectively he makes a bad decision for the right reasons or so he believes. And then everything is effectively him making that right or trying to make that right. The fact that we then wake up on, they wake up on earth and he's endangered a whole load of innocent alien life forms to him. You know, it, again, it just, to me, it adds, the fact that he makes a mistake and is in continually trying to put that right or atone for it gives the character far more depth than just saying he's this great guy and he always gets it right. And I really wanted to say that, you know, not that I don't want to undermine the character, but that everything afterwards is I need to sort of put this right. I need to stop this escalating. I need to make right what I've done. And to carry that burden around is, you know, what often great men do, especially in a war situation. It's very hard to get all the decisions right. And I just I just felt it gave every sort of subsequent action from Optimus Prime a, a slightly different slant that he's always carried around this nugget of having set all these balls in motion that really could have been avoided with a different decision. So, you know, when he later sub subsequently sacrifices himself, it's maybe more understandable that, it's, you know, if I'm just making this matter worse, maybe it's better to remove myself from this. So maybe it just explains some of the, the sort of later sacrifices, you know, I'm still not totally certain about sacrificing yourself in a computer game, but that story is, <laughs> is what it is, you know. But, but still underlying that, I wanted something that said, this is this speaks to why he is like he is. Mm -hmm. So in, in general, uh, we were, I mean, we were surprised last year to get Transformers 84 and coming back to... Uh, the you know the early '80s Marvel comics. So what what was the genesis of coming back to this backstory? I mean, we had Regeneration One a few years ago that wrapped up the old Marvel series, taking us up to 100. Uh, so what 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 got you back? What what pulled you back in this time to to get you back into the '80s? Well, uh, you know, it was IDW just came to me. It was the 35th anniversary. Is that right? Yes, 35th uh, yes, anniversary. Yeah, yeah, and. Basically, they wanted something. It was only ever meant to be a one shot. You know, the, the, that we got the limited series is great, but it was just meant to be an anniversary thing. And they thought, and I agreed that the best way to do that, well, initially it started off, the first idea was to do a prequel 
to the original series, almost, you know, literally like an issue zero to the original run. But to me, that was limiting because they're at peace. You know, an awful lot happens in those first four or five pages. But ostensibly, before issue one, they're all at peace. You know, there might be Megatron plotting in the background, but they didn't feel there was enough story there. You know, having said that, I see, I see now Brian Ruckley come on to the new ongoing and do a brilliant, you know, pre-Civil War storyline. But I kind of felt we were limited to what we could do with it. So at that point, I counter-suggested that we did this storyline that loops in and out of what we know because they felt like there were big enough gaps there to fill. And then subsequently, I got the idea of, looping in Man of Iron as, well, we got the first UK story as well, but to fill in some blanks with that maybe and make it more canon, it always felt like a little bit of a standalone story, Man of Iron. And so I really wanted to put it back into that this, you know, it had been reprinted. It was one of the few UK stories that Marvel US reprinted in its run. So it felt like the perfect one to pull back in and say, no, this really happened, and this is the truth of it again. So, you know, and so, you know, while it took a couple of liberties, I, I really think it, it gave us a chance to say these, it was rather than just two robots in a, in a spacecraft, it's these two robots in a spacecraft for a reason, and that that is itself connected to the main storyline in 84. So, yeah, it just, it, it was always meant to be just a one shot. Never thought we'd get a chance to do more. So when IDW came back and said, can we do a four issue series? I already had a stack of ideas and again, more gaps I felt could be filled or touched upon. So, you know, yeah, it's evolved from there. And, you know, I would, dearly love to do more and you know i hope it's done well enough for idw that you know there's scope because i believe there's enough story out there for maybe another four issue series down the line when you had that initial conversation was was the was the plan to see if you could also get andrew and jeff back together uh no i don't think that was ever really on the cards i i think right from the start idw had an idea that Guido would be the right artist for it. And, you know, I think they're completely right because when we used Guido on Regeneration 1, he was able almost seamlessly to drop into a run that Andrew had been drawing and not exactly draw in Andrew's style, but not a million miles dissimilar either. He's, he's a real chameleon of an artist. And he was able to do stuff that you would have looked at and said, well, that's Guido. And yet the flow didn't really jar between Andrew's issues and Guido's. The so, word I use for Guido is respectful. He's very respectful of who yes. came before him. He is, but he's also very good at kind of subsuming his own style and, mm -hmm. and making it work. And so I think right from the start, he was – he was the first choice for 84 just because we'd seen IDW myself had seen what he could do with regeneration one. And, and what's amazing with Guido's work on 84, I think is that it's, it is amazingly like the original Marvel comics and yet nothing like them. You know, obviously there's everything he does from poses to, to angles, to certain shots. He chooses very carefully, so he's still drawing as Guido, but you're almost conned into thinking you're looking at something older, something from that Marvel run. And then on top of that, you have JP's amazing colours, which which mimic the, the old colours, colouring system. And so you just get almost completely sucked into this idea that you see, it's a very modern looking comic and yet it has that complete feel of those original stories as well. 
Sorry, Charles. I had to ask. <laughs> no, it's fine. <laughs> Everyone can ask a question. That's fine. <laughs> No, I mean that, and you know, some of these are your questions, Yoshi. So that's okay. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, just in general, what's how is it uh, work? I mean, working with with artists like Guido, with John Paul Bove. I mean, that, these days in the digital age, I imagine it's much easier to communicate, to share pages and things. Like in the in the eighties, was everything basically via via mail, where you'd, you'd mail stuff off, wait a couple of weeks, and and get a response back, and and now everything's pretty much instant. Yeah, you know, it was back in the day. It was fax machines, and and uh, and yes, the the mails, the post service, or courier. You know, most artwork landed in the Marvel UK offices, either you know sent riskily through the the Royal Mail, or um, were brought in by the artists. A lot of the artists, even if they weren't London-based, would make trips down with the artwork they were bringing in. <coughs> Excuse me. Rather than go and risk it sort of disappearing en route. Uh, so, yeah, you know, it's, of course, nowadays you can see breakdowns and discuss and do revisions and even once you get to finish pages, we can have, you know, tweaks and changes. So, of course, it's, in theory, much more foolproof. Um, but, of course, stuff still creeps through. You know, we, we missed completely with issue two that we'd drawn a scene or Guido had drawn a scene with Impactor in it and uh, Sandstorm and, uh, and Springer and... The, the wreckers he's not supposed to know at this point in terms of the UK storyline that followed. But we sort of missed that. We got the wreckers right, but we missed in that scene that the characters who shouldn't have been together were together. So, you know, you can't catch everything. But, yeah, it's obviously it's much, much better now. Mm -hmm. So uh, one thing that uh, that I appreciated, of course, being a fan of the of the old Marvel comics and having read all the issues, I, I saw a lot of deep cuts in the uh, in Transformers 84, you know, things like, oh, yeah, this connects to this and this and this. And, you know, particularly Thunderwing, seeing Thunderwing and Scorponok show up, uh, seeing references to Straxus and the smelting pool and everything. So. How do you balance putting all those deep cut references in from the Marvel Comics lore, but still keeping the stories relatively self-contained for casual readers? Yeah, I mean, I think you just have to be aware that not to include things that will baffle people. So, you know, if you're going to put Straxus in and have a throwaway line about a smelting pool, people will get that who know the storylines. But to others it doesn't really matter that much. You know, they're going to see the smelting pool happen in an issue's time, so they'll get what a smelting pool is. It's just all the time you have to have kind of two eyes on it, the, the, the fans, the people who know the original stories. So you're layering in stuff, you're joining dots, you know, you're including, you know, real sort of touchstones from those issues. But on the other hand, you've got to look at it and go, is this still telling a story that you can just jump in and read? So, you know, it's that thing of Easter eggs. They're there, but they kind of, if you put Easter eggs in and they're baffling to the readers, you've just got to be aware that that's a no-no or, you know, use that very sparingly. So I think I've always tried with 84 to make it as first-time reader if there's such a thing as Transformers comics these days, as, as, <laughs> as possible. And certainly you can't, you know, it may well be picked up by somebody who's read the IDW continuity but never read the Marvel com the comics. So it, it's lovely to have the commentary in the back so you can flag up all these things, but it just can't be a kind of essential thing in the story. It can't only be accessible to the people who know. So it's a fine balancing act. I hope I've got it right with 84. Um, but yeah, you've just got to have those two eye, two pairs of eyes on it all the time. Right. 
So uh, you made punch slash counter punch the the core point of view character in Transformers 84. Uh, do you plan to explore some of the, I guess, the the guilt and divided loyalty that he has uh, as a result of his actions? I mean, we, we've seen him, uh, you know, he is clearly his Autobot uh, sympathies direct him to, to do what's right. He takes the information back to Ultra Magnus. But he is basically he stands by while Straxus is executing lots of Autobots in the smelting pool. And of course, he, he doesn't say anything because he's counterpunch and he, he can't give himself away. But I imagine that that creates a lot of internal conflict for him. Yeah, it does. And, you know, I'd never used this character before. Um, I, I say that, but possibly he was in a <laughs> UK story, but I never used him in any great extent. And once I did, I, I just found him a completely fascinating character. And this idea that when he switches from one to the other, it's not like he's punched all the time in a different set of armor. He's very much a different character when he's counter punch. And, you know, it's, it's a kind of split personality. It's the dark half. It's all those interesting psychological things. And I thought immediately, I kind of love this character because you know, it's that thing again. I was talking with Grimlock of the ones who are who walk that fine line and could go either way are are more interesting as characters, and you never quite know what to expect. And you know, is he punch? Is he counter punch? You know, there's it's a it's a something I'd really like to again if we do more eighty four to explore more of. You know, he's very much to an extent the narrator in in this mini series and the and the issue zero but i f- i figure if we go on with him i'd like to make him much more of a, a a part of the the action as well i mean there's a little bit of that in 84 but i'd like to get more inside his head or heads as, as if we get a chance to do more of that he's a, he's a great character yeah. I think this is actually the first time he's been written like that. I think usually he is just an Autobot in disguise as as a Decepticon. Yeah, I mean, I, and I thought that was that's fine, but I I always look to see whether there's something more you can do with a character, yeah. something a little different, you know. And again, it comes I think from that IDW experience of okay, there's Ultra Magnus. Can we do him in a little way? Not, you know, sort of trash anything that's come before but is there a little twist on his character every time and i suppose that's just what fascinates me about storytelling and character driven stuff is is to take those characters you think you know and you know twist them one way or the other and turn things on their head and and hopefully confound expectations yeah so it, what? So I mean, you mentioned if you get the chance to get um, more to do more with Transformers eighty four. So what can we do as fans? I mean, is it just encourage everyone to buy as many copies as possible and make sure people buy the trade paperback and everything? Absolutely. You know, I mean, I think you know. While I would love to say it's you know it's all to do with IDW loving to employ me, I have a feeling it's probably also <laughs> down to this thing performing well enough as a comic in its own right and then a collected edition. So, you know, I think the issue zero did well. You know, as far as I know, the 84 is doing well as a limited series. But, yeah, it's just, you know, it's, we've had great reviews from you guys, thank you very much, and lots of other online sources. So I think there's a critical mass here that says we've pleased people you can't please everybody, but you know, I think we've pleased a lot of the sort of fans, even some of the diehards out there. And I think, you know, sales in the end is if it does well enough for IDW, there's every chance that we might do another one. Great. Maybe, maybe we'll even get uh, up to issue 80 in a four issue limited series. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, that would be great. I'd be, I'd be fine with that. <laughs> So, um, I mean, you've you've worked on more than just Transformers. I wanted to also ask you, 
about uh, the the comic you're doing with Jeff Senior uh, to the death. Maybe you could tell folks who who haven't maybe haven't uh, heard of that or, or gotten a chance to check that out. What that's about? Yeah, we um, a while back Jeff and I had talked about doing something together again, creator owned. Jeff largely now works in advertising, doing storyboards and animatics. Uh, apart from anything, I think it pays a lot better than comics work, but hey. But <laughs> I think he was also just feeling that that need to kind of create and go wild and and do something that wasn't, you know, a guy walking along or drinking a can of Coke or something else. You know, I think he was just feeling a little bit bottled up. And so we just said, look, let's tap into some of the things we've done before. We did a series called Dragon's Claws back in the 80s and, of course, Death's Head. And that had that kind of sci-fi, you know, slightly, you know, sort of acerbic humour, you know, just sort of that edge that a lot of British comics like 2000 AD brought to their storytelling. And we thought, well, let's channel some of that energy from those series, which, you know, still thankfully are reprinted and out there. But we wanted to do something that was ours, that was different. And so it's very much channeling those series we did for Marvel UK, but creating something completely new. It's a big sci-fi conspiracy thriller set in the future on a a dystopian world that's being, you know, literally ground down to extinction by huge corporations and kind of one man against the system, but with a backdrop of war on other worlds and war as mass entertainment. So, you know, hopefully it's got a sort of a, a current satirical, cynical look at the world in it. But, you know, it was a chance to cut loose. It's got a alien soldier of fortune style character called Killer Toa, who's kind of our death's head. So we took our sort of greatest hits, I guess. There's a few mechs in there. So, you know, we just bundled everything into this, what turned into a 10 issue maxi series. Uh, and, yeah, it's all out there now. And, you know, it's available on Comixology in digital form. Here in the UK, it's available in print and slipcased editions. So, yeah, it's, it, you know, it's, it was a mammoth undertaking, but we're really pleased with it. And uh, lovely to have something that we did ourselves and published ourselves. And, you know, we had some help from a company called Get My Comics, who acted as our publisher, distributor, and involved us literally getting on the phone to comic shops and asking them to stock it. So it was a, it was a great fun experience and very pleased with it now, sort of sitting in its, its slipcase sets. Awesome. So uh, people can, can find that. I think it's with to the death.com, right? To dash the dash death.com. That's it. Yeah. And like I say, it's available on comicology. So you can read it in digital format if you want, or, you know, if you're, if you can stand a bit of uh, sort of postage costs, uh, you know, get my comics to ship to the U S and worldwide. So it is there. If anybody wants to have a look, it's kind of Jeff and I doing what we do. <laughs> so, I mean, since you were uh, working for Marvel UK at the time of writing transformers, you created some original characters like uh, a death's head. You mentioned, also, I remember the Neo Knights. Those were a, a latter day in Transformers. You know, the first kind of superhero slash mutant group in uh, introduced into Transformers. And I know there was a there were plans or thoughts of doing a series about them. Uh, would you Would you ever go back to them if maybe if Marvel slash Disney ever uh, ever had the op uh, ever gave you the opportunity? You know, I'd I'd like to do something with um, the Neo Knights, and you know. There's nothing to say we couldn't do some kind of Transformers 84-esque reappearance of them <laughs> if we ever got that far with it. You know, I'd love to. I don't I you know, I think there's there might be problems using Circuit Breaker now, but you know, I'm sure we could, 
you know, work around that. I don't know how easy or difficult it would be to to use those characters without a kind of Marvel stamp on them. So, mm-hmm. but, you know, never say never on these things. And, you know, I, I really enjoyed doing those issues and, and bringing those characters into the mix. So who knows? I'd love to if we get a chance. So uh, do you have anything uh, anything coming up in the future that uh, that you're interested to talk about or, or anything we can plug or any future comic works that you've got coming out soon? Yeah, I mean, I'm working on a few things at the moment. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm heavily involved in Transformers Earth Wars, which is a mobile game. Um, I, I don't think it's just over here. I think it's generally available. Um, and that is a kind of ongoing thing, really, that, you know, that started four or so years ago, and I still supply the, the saga storylines for that and dialogues for when they bring in new characters. So that's, that's been an amazingly evolving thing that, you know, we got to debut the Dinobot combiner in Earth Wars, and we brought in two original characters, Sentius Magnus and Sentius Malus, who are unique to the game, so which was very cool, all done with you know, Hasbro's designers. So it, it's been a great fun job. Um, I'm doing some a, a comic version of a 90s arcade game called Battletoads at the moment, nice. which you know, is making a comeback as a, as a game, and there's a, there's a comic to go along with that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm doing a, a few more sort of self-published things. And, yeah, just generally, you know, they're, they're just keeping busy, really. And uh, I'm always, you know, hopeful that we'll get to do some more Transformers 84. Cool. I, I do notice you're wearing the Wreck and Rule shirt. I, I think yep. that, that was uh, – yeah. Well <laughs> I, our yeah. friend, uh, friend of the show, Lady Wreck, uh, was uh, was producing those shirts a little while That's ago. Right. Yeah, you know, generally, I, I, if I knew she was coming over to uh, a Transformers UK convention, I'd always ask if I can have a sort of refresher of the shirt because they wear out. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, no, fabulous. And she, uh, Lady Wreck actually had a McAdams T-shirt with her last time she was over, so I picked up one of those too. Thank you so much uh, for coming on and, and talking with us. Well, thanks for inviting me, guys. It's been a pleasure. And, uh, you know, I've, I've loved listening to the podcast. So thanks a lot for all the kind words on 84. Oh, th- thank you. And thanks so much for continuing to listen. Uh, we, we appreciate it. It's always great to know. I mean, seriously, you're, you're one of my heroes. I mean, one of, the, one of the people I grew up with on Transformers. Uh, and you've you, since you've kept coming back to Transformers over 35 years, there's been so much that that, that I've really enjoyed uh, that you've worked on that that I've enjoyed reading and watching. So so thank you so much for everything you've done for this franchise and and everything you've contributed and and just making Transformers what it is today. Uh, thanks very much. It's much appreciated. And you know, it's you guys who have kept me in a job for all these years. So thank you. <laughs> Well, we we hope you're you'll you'll keep on going and and yeah, I, in particular more Transformers eighty four, but you know just more Transformers in general. So yeah, thanks. Definitely works for me. It never ends, as I'm fond of saying. <laughs> so uh, where can people find you on the internet on social media? Yeah, I'm I'm on Facebook and Twitter and uh, and yeah, you know otherwise you know you can you can also find. To the death on Facebook and Twitter. We're always keeping an eye on that. So yeah, you know, just generally reach out. There's a there's a regeneration one Facebook page where we've just field any general Transformers questions and queries. So yeah, you know, I'm out there if uh, you want to send me some questions. Awesome. All right, everyone. Thanks so much uh, for listening and watching to our interview with Mr. Simon Furman. Uh, This is from the Transmissions Podcast. You can find us at transmissionspodcast.com. We do lots of different podcasts. We do uh, uh, two shows every week. We do a toy show all about Transformers toys and merchandise. And we do a Transformers media show, Transmissions Alt Mode, every uh, Friday, where we talk about all about Transformers comics and media. 
Uh, and we review a lot of Transformers comics, of which Transformers 84 is one of them. And we are looking forward to the final issue of Transformers 84. It should be coming uh, very soon. No, 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 no. We want a lot more. What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> we want a lot more. <laughs> the final issue in this series. That, that, yes. Not the final issue forever. <laughs> But uh, but that should be out. Uh, it might already be out by the time you're uh, you're watching this. But also check out the uh, the trade paperback, which collects issue zero and one through four. That should be out in a, in a month or two's time. It should be available very soon. Yeah, uh, I so think yeah, actually everyone. as well uh, in November there's a mm-hmm. a one shot that collects the issue zero issue. If you miss that and the original stories. So issue one of Marvel US and Man of Iron. I think that's out in November from IDW. Great. Cool. Okay. So uh, be on the lookout for that as well. Brilliant. Well, thank you guys. All right. Thanks everyone. And we'll see you next time. Bye everybody. All right. Bye. Later. <laughs>